Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and this time I want to run through a taxonomy of Aquinas's ideas about virtue. Uh, now, this is a follow-up uh, follow discussion on the previous lecture, which goes over the importance of uh, insignificant action, or at least apparently insignificant action, to the cultivation of virtue. And if you haven't watched that one yet, I recommend you do so first. So now, I want to look through um, how, again, Ralph McInerney in this text, Ethica Domestica, in, in uh, chapter seven, or sorry, chapter six, uh, Character and Decision, how he goes through and explains the taxonomy of Aquinas's ideas of virtue. The different virtues, in other words, the different virtues that we can divide up in Aquinas's work and Aquinas's thought in general. I've already gone over the importance or the comparative importance of these uh, of virtue as such, but I want to go through specifically now and look at what the virtues are, how they're divided, how they interact with each other as well. So let's see. Here we go. So what we have here are three of the speculative virtues, as Aquinas calls them. These are the virtues or pseudo-virtues, which find their place in theoretical reason. So the theoretical reason is distinct from the practical reason, because the theoretical reason is that which has, uh, that which is concerned with abstracts, speculation, speculables, as he calls them. These are abstract principles, abstract ideas that do not have particular practical application. And so the, uh, the theoretical reason's object is knowledge, ideas, beliefs, etc. And so the virtues of the theoretical reason, these three, have to do with how we interact with and how we discover those various truths and ideas and thoughts, etc. And so from the most abstract to the most concrete and specific, we have understanding. Understanding, first of all, is our grasp of first principles. So this is our grasp. This is our capacity to understand, so to speak, the first principles of reasoning the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, the law of identity, and understand the rules for syllogistic thinking. Understand how we go from one idea to another. It's basically the idea of grasping good sense, good reasoning, and distinguishing between good reasons and bad reasons. Next on the line, we have science. Uh, what, uh, again, in McInerney's translation, he says science, uh, the Latin being scientia, which we can also think of as knowledge. This is slightly more practical, not practical, more specified, I guess I should say, uh, than the objects of understanding. The objects of science or knowledge are particulars. If understanding understands universals, science knows the particulars. It goes to what we can observe and discover, and then what we can derive from our observations, our discoveries, and the practical, or the, sorry, the, the abstract principles that understanding gives us. So for example, if I know that, uh, for, if I know that, uh, this is, uh, this is a container for, this is a container capable of holding liquid. There is currently water in it. Therefore, it will not, uh, it will not leak if I'm holding it upright. Because again, it is capable of holding liquid. I know so. I know what it's capable of doing. I know what it is doing. It is holding, in fact, a liquid. And so, if it is held normally and held correctly, it will not leak it. Okay. Now, this is uh, this is theoretical reason, because while it is about uh, while it is about practical objects, and you'll find that distinction in another uh, in another video. It is about the theoretical aspects of those those. Um, those practical objects. It is about the natures of the things and what we can determine about those natures about those things, and therefore what we can determine about those things from our abstract process of reasoning that understanding gives us access to. So science is how we under how we go from abstract to particular. And then finally we have theoretical wisdom. Wisdom, in this sense for Aquinas, is a uh, is how we connect ideas together, particular ideas, how we understand their relationship to each other, and then ultimately how we understand their relationship to their ultimate source, being God, the Logos, God qua the Logos. 
And so wisdom in this sense is the relationship between science and theology. It is the objects of theology itself, as well as the objects of, of the various, what we would call scientific analyses or, or uh, examinations, but we really might mean any kind of knowledge. And then how these individual objects of knowledge and of, <clears throat> of reasoning relate to one another and connect to one another in this great web of knowledge that we possess. Because we can go from, we understand, and we, we know from science that we can go from one piece of knowledge abstract and then reparticularized to another, wisdom is knowing how those relate to one another and how they relate to their ultimate causes, that being the divine. Right. Next, if we have theoretical reason, we also have what McInerney lays out as the two, uh, the two particular virtues of practical reason. So if theoretical reason is theoretical wisdom, practical reason has practical wisdom or what's called prudence. It also has what we call art, um, which we can also call craftsmanship. Um, so if prudence or practical wisdom is practical reason employed for the doing of things, art is right reason or practical reason employed for the making of things. So we have the two main part, the main portions of practical reason, doing and making. And we have a virtue for each of them. Now, it's worth noting here, and McInerney does note this, that especially once we get to this point, that each of these virtues will further subdivide into prudence with respect to a, doing a particular kind of thing and art with respect to making a particular kind of thing. Right? For art, this is actually quite simple and quite straightforward and very intuitive. You might be particularly good at making something, but not very good at making something else. You might be in, in sort of visual art kind of thing, you might be a great painter, but a terrible sculptor, for example. The same will apply to prudence. You might be particularly good at a kind of activity. So you might be a great baseball player, but that doesn't mean that you're a good golfer. Okay. So again, these are our basic virtues of practical reason, but they also rely on what we would call uh, pseudo virtues things that are like virtues but aren't quite technically because they're not part of character uh, character as such. And that is conscience, which is roughly the equivalent of science for practical reason. And syndesis, this is Aquinas' term, which is roughly the equivalent of understanding for practical reason. So conscience is roughly the equivalent of science, but on the practical side rather than the theoretical side. So conscience is our ability to take abstract moral principles, abstract ethical norms, and apply them to particular situations. Right? So if prudence or practical wisdom is, is knowing how to accomplish our ends, conscience is knowing what ends we ought to accomplish. It tells you what's right and what's wrong, in other words. It's, the, it's still very much the Jiminy Cricket little idea, but, uh, but here applied in terms of uh, applied in terms of uh, more uh, a connection between, say, uh, how to do something and knowing abstract principles. Now, syndesis is uh, our sort of non-reflective, immediate understanding of moral norms or ethical principles. Syndesis is how we know what is right and what is wrong in the most abstract sense. That we know that certain things are simply right. <clears throat> this is our grasp of, say, first principles, the fundamental norms, uh, the, the fundamental bases of natural law. These we achieve through synderesis. We automatically or immediately, at least ought to, if we have this virtue, if we've trained this virtue, we immediately recognize the good in its very nature. All right, scooching over, in addition to those virtues and those pseudo-virtues which reside in practical reason, we also have two virtues that reside in the appetite, and they are temperance and courage. Now, temperance is the mean between excess and deficiency with respect to fulfillment of our desires, because these, take, uh, these are uh, aligned with or part of the appetites. Temperance is a virtue of the concupiscible part of our appetite, so concupiscence uh, or the concupiscible part of our appetite is that which strives for things. It wants to acquire. It wants to acquire good things, in other words. 
courage is the corresponding virtue for the irascible part of our appetite. So our irascible appetites are, uh, are rather than seeking the good, they are, uh, our irascible appetites are those which avoid or shun bad or evil or harm. And so if our concupiscible appetite might be, say, hunger, or a, a similar irascible appetite uh, might be disgust. You might want food, but you might not want rotten food. Okay, and so courage, because it has to do with keeping threats away from us, is a mean between excess and deficiency of fear. Now, you might have too much fear, in which case you have the vice of cowardice. Or you might have too little fear, in which case you're foolhardy. You go and do things that are, that are dumb for no particular reason, that are unnecessarily dangerous, say. And so these are the most prototypical character virtues. <clears throat> these are the virtues that are very clearly means between excess and deficiency, uh, which is the, particularly how, uh, how Aristotle emphasizes virtue. And so both of these are in the appetites, one in the concupiscible part, one in the irascible part. Again, temperance about, about acquiring things, but acquiring the right amount of things, not going to excess, seeking too much, but also not neglecting one's needs. Whereas courage is about keeping oneself safe from danger, but still doing what must be done in the face of danger, doing the right thing despite being afraid. All right. And finally, uh, the last of the, uh, the character virtues is justice, which is um, treating persons as they ought to be treated. So justice involves our interpersonal relationships and treating things according to their due, but particularly in terms of persons, right? Aquinas in particular considers justice to be uniquely about relationships between persons. It can include our relationship to ourself because I am a person as well. And so how I treat and think of myself is also part of justice. Um, but it is primarily, at least, how we relate to other people. So we ought to treat people appropriately given who they are and given their, our, our mutual relationships. Right. So among these, we have these four, which are known as the cardinal virtues. So cardinal uh, comes from the term for a hinge. So these are the four virtues upon which all of the others hinge. That's prudence, or practical wisdom, temperance, or moderation, courage, and justice. These are the four primary character virtues. These are the ones that we primarily will uh, will focus to cultivate and the ones that are most morally significant. Uh, and they are also, uh, of the virtues, the most, uh, the most natural in terms of they are the most constitutive of our nature. They determine how it is that our nature applies to our action. Okay, so we've got all of these, but that's not all. Um, we've got one heck of a taxonomy here, but these, the ones listed here, are, according to Aquinas, the various natural virtues. Now, we also have what are called the supernatural virtues. So first of all, we have the supernatural or infused versions of all of these. These are gifts of, say, the sacraments. These are gifts of grace that we, that we may or may not receive from God which are equivalent to these various virtues that we can either cultivate once we have them or dismiss and, and, uh, and cultivate the opposite and, and dismiss them, turn to vice rather, turn to vice instead, which is turning away from God, essentially. But in addition to the supernatural or infused versions of the various natural virtues, we also have the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love or charity. Now, the simplest, most important uh, and easiest to explain of these is love. Love, uh, in the theological sense, is willing the good of the other for their own sake. So it is benevolence, if you will. It is wanting and acting towards someone else's benefit because they stand to benefit from it. Not from what I might gain. Not, from, uh, not for the sake of the benefit of the community. Not... Uh, not even for any of the reasons of virtue listed below, but rather because it is good for them as such. In addition to this, we have hope. Hope <clears throat> is, if you want to think about it this way, something like the white pill. This is the willingness to believe that things will turn out right. 
It is placing one's trust in divine providence. It is the belief that God has what is good for the world in mind, and that will ultimately be accomplished. Now again, this may not be the short term, this may not be in this life, but hope insists that there is a good end for things. Uh, this is actually quite related to a, uh, to a, vi a video I've, uh, I'm working on, uh, on Tolkien's philosophy of history. I'm not sure which of these will come out first, so if that one's already out, go back and look at it. If not, you'll see it next. And finally, we have faith. Faith uh, is, first of all, not simply religion. Uh, it's also not simply uh, belief in God. I have another video in my philosophy of religion playlist that goes into this distinction as well. But faith splits more or less into two parts, into the theoretical and the practical aspects. The theoretical part of faith is to believe that which we have, we have good reason to believe is revealed by God. It is to believe what God tells us, in other words, whether directly or indirectly. That can be directly through sources of revelation, that can be indirectly through the doctrines of the church, or through, uh, through natural theology, or what have you. But it is to believe what comes from God. The practical aspect of faith is to hold fast to those ideas in the face of difficulty, to place one's trust in God to act faithfully, so to speak, to God. And so this is somewhat analogous to courage, uh, but of a, of a sort of theological and intellectual sort, rather than a character virtue. All right, so those are all of the virtues, or at least all of the major virtues in Thomas Aquinas. Uh, a couple of more points to, to mention, however. First of all, that while those are all of the virtues, you also could go on to subdivide each and every one of them into more and more and more smaller categories. That would take an enormous amount of time, and that's why McInerney at least gives up on the process after a few pages, simply because it, it, uh, it would take you know several books of this length, roughly speaking, simply to do that. And he doesn't emphasize the topic of virtue nearly as much as he does natural law and acting in accordance with right reason, etc. If you are looking for it, uh, it is in Thomas Aquinas's Secunda Secund or Prima Secundi, um, the treatise on virtue, or the treatise on character, or sorry, the treatise on habit, sorry, uh, which is approximately uh, question 55 through 97, I believe it is. Um, if it's not, I will place the correct citation just here. Um, or if it is, either way, I'll put it there. <clears throat> in any case, for more on these particular subdivisions, particularly things like the subdivisions of prudence into uh, into uh, what some scholars I know of have called micro-prudences, prudence with respect to this or that thing, courage with respect to this or that kind of activity or kind of threat, justice in this or that social arrangement, etc. Those sorts of things. You can, of course, like I said, subdivide any of these virtues almost infinitely because the particular kinds of actions that we, that we enact are nearly infinite in number, at least at least hypothetically infinite in number. And so to have virtue associated with all of them means that you're having to subdivide them nearly infinitely, and you perfectly well can. However, despite this plethora of, uh, of micro-virtues, there is still an interrelationship between all of them. And this is uh, what is referred to as the unity of the virtues thesis. And this is the thesis that to have one virtue in its entirety, in its perfection, is necessarily to have all of them. Because if you are lacking in any one virtue, it is going to have negative impacts on the rest of them, to the point where you're going to be missing something from all of the rest of the virtues as well. The easiest example of this is if you are missing courage, if you are cowardly, then you're not going to be acting justly, because doing the right thing in terms of justice is, is sometimes at least dangerous. And so cowardice will prevent you from doing so, and so your virtue of courage will diminish, or virtue of justice will be diminished by your lack of courage. Your temperance will might be diminished by your lack of justice, because you might be uh, might be persuaded to unjustly acquire more than you are due and more than you ought to. And so your uh, your your prudence, your practical wisdom might further be diminished due to various uh, various problems with your uh, with your acquisitiveness, etc. And all of your virtues gradually decay, starting from one point. Now, Aquinas is not set 
uh, not nearly as set on the unity of virtue, unity of the virtues thesis as some uh, some more ancient thinkers. However, he does think certainly that a fault in one virtue can harm others, can lead to faults elsewhere in our moral psychology, and that the development of one virtue can help to encourage the development of others as well. In other words, forming some bad habits is going to spread to other bad habits, and forming some good habits is going to help spread to other good habits as well, or at least it's going to make the formation of those other good habits far easier. And so the development or the cultivation of virtue is one large project that we partake in, we, we participate in this project little bit by little bit by little bit with each of our, again, apparently insignificant actions. This going back to the last video that I mentioned. So again, once again, I will leave you with this idea that we need to carefully consider our seemingly insignificant actions because they will contribute to this or that virtue in some way, again, cumulatively, as we act more and more and more. So hopefully this was helpful, and hopefully this was uh, this was a, a useful schematization of the virtues, at least as uh, as outlined by Thomas Aquinas, uh, filtered through Ralph McInerney, um, and hopefully some of this is uh, both useful information, helpful information, and not only will help us understand uh, the virtues and understand this moral theory, but it might even help us to be a little bit better.